today we have the honor to have with us Luis Fernando Castaneda Monter, who is a theologian, a Mariologist. He is a member of the Superior Institute of Guadalupe Studies in Mexico City. For the past 16 years plus, uh, Luis Fernando has been generously volunteering his time to provide guided visits for pilgrims to the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe and to the sacred places where she appeared. And in various other places, uh, Luis Fernando has been invited also to speak on Our Lady. So today we have the privilege, the honor to have with us today, Luis Fernando who will share with us in four moments uh, the conferences uh, as an introduction to Our Lady of Guadalupe. Welcome, Fernando. The first part is the Aztecs, what they believed, what they thought, how they saw themselves and their place in the world, and how they saw the universe. The first part is there, there's uh, the god, the sun, the god of the sun, is the greatest of all the gods. They represent this with an eagle. The sun flies on the back of the eagle, and here we see how the eyes, around the eyes, there's the sun rays. We see how the the eagle is taking the sun, rises, flies in the morning, and then reaches zenith, which there is a transformation, and then starts setting it down. Their idea is that uh, to help the sun get, make this journey, he has to fight. The eagle, every afternoon, meets up with a jaguar that wants to put it out. The jaguar represents darkness because of the spots on the pelt of the jaguar that represents the night sky, the stars. The spots are the stars in the night sky. The, um, the meeting of the two started a war for survival. So the red light that we see on the horizon is the blood of the two animals that are beginning to fight for survival. However, we have to help, obviously, the eagle to win. We want the sunlight because the sun brings agriculture, makes uh, plants grow. If the jaguar wins, life would be lost. It would end. So we have to feed constantly. They practice what is called a sympathetic magic, which means that whatever they believe that whatever we do on Earth do affects directly the gods, which will then affect back to us. So it's a relationship with the, with the gods. This was um, seen as opposing forces that complement each other. We have uh, the jaguar and the eagle, light and dark. The near, the far, cold and heat. All of these opposing forces that are necessary for life to complement uh, each other. The moon, in this case, Koyoshauki, the moon, is one of the opponents of the god of the sun. So he fights against her. She is decapitated and she's also dismembered. So the son fights against his sister, which Chilopochtli fights against Koyoshauki every day for supremacy, but every morning he wins. As the sun rises, the moon and the stars disappear. He chases away the other ones. The reason why she is dismembered and in, in pieces is because of the faces of the moon. When we see the faces of the moon, we see different parts of the, of the moon, then that's exactly what it is. She, we, we see sometimes parts of her. The mythology is a non-scientific way of explaining nature. Most all mythologies come from the observation of nature, all of the phenomena. If there is lightning, there's somebody up there throwing down uh, the rays. So for different, for different cultures through history, we find Zeus or Jupiter that throws down the, the um, lightning. Then in, um, in Scandinavian mythology, we have Thor. Thunder is the hammer of Thor. It sounded like a hammer banging down on an anvil. The, uh, for our natives, it was the god of rain. So each one, Tlaloc, we'll see him in a moment. So each one of the gods has an attribute, and that is just different parts of nature. We see how 
the optical illusion of the rising of the sun and the stars and all of this, they're being, they come out of the horizon. So they're being born every day from the earth. So the earth becomes mother. This is Coatlicue, mother earth. She has been decapitated. The blood that comes out of the neck becomes two snakes that face each other. And that becomes her face. We see here the eyes and the mouth of the two serpents make up a new face. Her arms have also been cut off. And we see the snakes as well. She has the legs of an eagle. She's the mother of the god of the sun. The claws of eagles for legs. And we see this snake here, the serpent, that is the umbilical cord that is feeding and nurturing the ground. Her skirt is made of snakes, so her name is Coatlicue, the one with a skirt made of snakes. Snakes for them is life. If you open up a body, you will find entrails and veins and all of it. So we're all made up of snakes inside. So snakes is life. Snakes symbolize life. They also, uh, all mythologies, divinize usually what uh, they fear or what they require for survival. So in some places, the lion is a god. In, in um, Babylonia, in ancient cultures, in Persia, the lion is, a, is the mightiest animal, so it's a god. In India, it's usually the tiger. In this case, it's either the jaguar or the snake that has the power to kill you. So predators are usually considered to be gods because they are feared. So the, um, the rattlesnakes, particularly, are the ones symbolizing the um, life. We see here how she has a, um, a skull as the buckle of the belt. We see a belt here that is made out of two snakes. There's two snakes heads hanging down here. So it's directly over her womb. The belt in that position and the two hanging snakes ends of the, of the belt, that means that she's pregnant. And we see how the, the um, the skull represents death. It's over her womb, so it's life. So she's the goddess of life and death. I jokingly say that, you know how mothers say, I brought you into this world, I can take you out of it? She's the first one who said it. She started it all. The, uh, so it's life and death. She brings, she brings that, those elements. So generosity, her breasts are hanging down. She is the mother of the sun, the moon, and the stars. So all that generosity of giving life, that is the, the fact that she has breastfed 402 children. The, all of the symbols, everything they saw on her was generosity, life-giving, and goodness. Tlaloc, the god of rain, the god of, of hail, lightning, anything that comes from above, from the heavens, that is Tlaloc, the god of rain. We see his cloak is made out of feathers. And then it has these blue and white lines going through it. So the skies and the clouds. The feathers, the wind blows. Feathers always symbolize the wind. So the wind blows the clouds that bring the rains. So that's why his cloak is made, the symbolism of, of rain. Of course, they wanted the rain to be able to survive. Five months out of the year, there's the dry season. So they, it became desperate. If there was a drought, of course, that would be just devastating. So all of that was required, and that is why it was, um, he was venerated, the worshipped. The, they believed that if they carved a statue out of a single rock or made it out of a single piece, magically the spirit of the god would inhabit that statue. So they believed that they had the god right there. So that is idolatry. Then um, they would feed the gods. Since the gods couldn't open their mouths because they were statues, then they drilled the holes on the nose and that they would use incense. They would burn their different offerings in incense and that way they would feed the gods with smoke. So the gods wouldn't actually eat, bite down on the different offerings, but they could also cover the, the statues, particularly the statue of the eagle was drenched in blood from the different sacrifices. They believed that by 
or by take, taking out the heart, by taking a life with the sacrificial dagger, that was giving the breath to the gods. So they considered this to be one of the symbols of, of uh, breath and one of the sacred um, mandates in order to keep the gods alive. The white color that we see, the blade is white. The white color is actually the most, the, uh, the color of sacredness. So whatever is sacred, the, the white color, white birds, all of the white color is sacred. So the actual fact that they could have themselves in their hands the, um, the, the tool to feed the gods was for them the most precious one. We see how the handle of the, of the dagger is actually in the shape of an eagle warrior. In this case, it is a man dressed with an eagle attire. So that represents the general. That would be the equivalent of a five-star general. The man, the, uh, the highest ranking of the, um, if you want to look at this and pass it around. I need that back, please, it's not a souvenir. So, um, that was for them the way, one of the, the greatest way to, to um, participate with the gods. Particularly, of course, when they performed the human sacrifice, they were guaranteeing that the eagle, the sun, would have enough souls, enough warriors, to be able to fight against the jaguar. So usually prisoners of war and the men who died in battle were guaranteed to go to the sun, to go to the eagle, in order to help combat with the jaguar. The, uh, we see here the, the sun god, the very center of the sunstone, what you know as the Aztec calendar. It's the stone of the sun. And we have the sun god here. You see he's sticking out his tongue. His tongue is actually a dagger, a sacrificial dagger. So that is exactly what they're doing when they're um, taking the hearts. Their concept of the universe, is the, of the world, is that the earth is flat. The path of the sun divides the earth in half. That is that the rising of the sun is the most important place in the universe, in, the, in their cosmos. The uh, path of the sun and then the path of the wind. The, most, uh, the, the winds blow from the north in, in Mexico, particularly Mexico City. This is Aztec that I'm showing you. So for, they blow from the north. So the winds bring the clouds and the rains. So this is wind and water. This is um, fire, the sun, on the earth. Now that's a little bit of a stretch because there's earth everywhere, but that's OK. Just, that doesn't matter. It's mythology. You don't have to really look at it too, too close. And then we see how then the, uh, the world is divided into four. Earth, wind, fire, and water, the four elements. For them, the four elements is the principles of the building blocks of life. So where the four meet in the very center, that is the center of life, the beginning of life, the center of the universe, the springing of life. So they built their temple. The main temple was located as the center of the universe. That was the greatest pyramid that they had. As you can see, there's two, temple, two little temples on top, where the right-hand one was the Wichil Postli, the warrior god of the sun, and then the other one was Tlaloc, the god of rain. So fire and water were at the top. There were nine underworlds. They had no concept of hell. There was no hell for them. The nine underworlds are equivalent to the nine months we spend in gestation, so the pregnancy. The nine months in a place of darkness, so there's nine underworlds. The second underworld is paradise on earth. Then the 13 heavens, 13 multiplied times four, that's 52. Every 52 years is one century. Every 52 years is a cycle. Every 52 years, the calendar of the moon and the calendar of the sun meet. So every 52 years, every 52 cycles, every 52 uh, centuries, is an entire complete cycle. 
And that is when the world changes. That is a whole change. You've heard about how the world was going to end with the whole Mayan uh, prophecies. That's the cycle that ended. So we begin a new one. It wasn't that the world was coming to an end. It was that that path, that moment, was ending, and there was a, a complete new cycle beginning. There's a new era for the, for, for the sex, a new sun beginning. So they had change was constant for them, and that was normal. Every year we get uh, wet and dry. Life begins, life dies. So those cycles are constant, and that is not, no cycle is ever final. They knew that the world was coming to an end, and what they were going to do, what they were doing, was actually postponing that end. All of the rituals, everything they did to, with, to feed the gods was to postpone the final end. So they needed to continue those rituals. Their idea of hell was that if you stub your toe, if you had an ingrown toenail, if you got an infection, if you had a toothache, if you, had, uh, if you were bedridden, if you uh, broke a bone, if their crops failed, if there was a drought, and then diseases break out, all of that was punishment by the gods. So the gods weren't merciful. They wouldn't forgive you. Anything you did was actually punished. So they, they, were, they feared the gods to a point. And they were constantly trying to continually feeding and appeasing the gods so that they would know bad things would happen. But they, uh, they believed that it didn't matter so much how you lived your life, but how you died, because you were paying for whatever you did during life and how you died. Depending on how you died is the god that was taking your soul. So if you died by drowning, then you go to Tlaloc, the god of rain, and you get to play with water for all eternity. And that is the paradise on earth, the, god, the place of the god Tlaloc. They, um, they believe that the invisible connection between the heavens and, the, and the, um, the earth and the underworlds was through an invisible snake. So the snakes become the connection and the life giving. We see the snakes are actually depicted at the very base of the main temple that they consider to be the center of the world. The, uh, the wars, they had wars that were prearranged, the flower wars. Flowers were considered to be the happiness of the gods, the hearts of the gods. They had a deep root. Things needed to be deep rooted in order to have life. The root that the family has, the ancestors, the root that history has, all of these roots are the ones that will spring life. So roots are very important, and flowers are the happiness of the gods. When all is good, when everything is correct, then we get the flowers. The, um, they call them flower wars, because they were prearranged uh, wars when uh, the Aztec Empire could not expand anymore. They were, they, as they expanded, they reached a limit where they couldn't expand. So they prearranged wars with those people who had already been conquered. And they would meet at a certain time on a certain date. Then the high priest would stand on the side and watch everybody battling. When they had enough prisoners of war, he would raise his arms and everyone would stop fighting. And then everyone went home with their prisoners of war, kept them for an entire year, and then gave them up for sacrifice. The, um, so they would take the prisoner as their own family. They would actually end up living with them for a whole year as family. And when the man who had captured the prisoner would hand him over to the high priest, the high priest would receive him as his child. So a father was giving another father his child. It was the precious gift because that person would then go on to feed the gods and would give his life for the gods and for everyone else, for the perpetuation of life. So a few of them 
more than a few, did not like this. Not everyone was in favor of what the Aztecs were doing with this prearranged wars, with the flower wars. The, there were two types of sacrifice. There was the gladiator sacrifice and there was the altar sacrifice. This is the altar for the altar sacrifice. We see two snakes in the horizontal. So we have earth and water. The snake represents the earth because it has no legs and crawls. So it's the earth. The undulating movement of the snake is water, the same as water running down. Then we have wind and fire. So this is the center for all the elements. This is for life. They would place the person here to be sacrificed. The person would be drugged with hallucinogens, either um, peyote, marijuana, uh, magic mushrooms, some kind of hallucinogen so that he would feel nothing. He wouldn't even know where he was standing most of the time. He would feel absolutely nothing when they were extracting the heart. I know this is a little gruesome, I understand, but that was part. They were willing to give their life for God and for everyone else for life. They were, going, they were willing to go as far as giving their own children to the gods. The, um, they believed that the soul resided in the skull. So you can live without a limb, but you can't live without your head. So the soul must be inside the head. So they reserved the skulls of those who were sacrificed, and they would have them for the god Huitzilopochtli. And that was the symbol of their great love for the gods. And we see here the snakes giving life. They would perforate the skulls from side to side and then place them in the sompantli, which was that wall, like an abacus, placed with the skulls. Several of the Spaniards ended in there, and some, even a horse was sacrificed to the gods. So by their belief, the center of Tenochtitlan, the Aztec city, was the center of the universe. And this is where they had to continue doing the rituals for the preservation of the universe. We see the sacrificial dagger, as I showed you. The uh, white dagger is the sacred, and the red in the front, that symbolizes the offerings. That symbolizes that they have given the gods their life and their feet, they continue feeding the gods. They had a rattlesnake that would bite the person. They would have the rattlesnake bite the person. The neurotoxins of the poison of the snake would actually make them feel nothing. It was like an anesthesia. Then extract the heart and offer it. They were dressed in black. They were covered with ashes. This is a bit exaggerated. It was a little more precise than this. But anyway, they were covered in black. They were a giving life to the gods. The god, um, particularly the god Quetzalcoatl, was symbolized by the black color. We see the gladiator sacrifice that this person who was captured in war, he would have to battle. He had to die fighting in order to win the place with the sun, to continue fighting alongside the sun. There, every 52 years, they would add on a new layer to the, to the main temple, to the pyramid. They believed that in the place where the um, mountains are, it is a place where the underworlds push up to meet the heavens. So the top of a mountain, the top of a hill, is the place where the heavens and the earth meet. That is where you encounter the gods. Every 52 years, they would add on a whole new facade to the temple. And then every time there was a new emperor, they would add only the new steps. And he would continue to increase the empire and establish that the cult of Quetzalcoatl, the cult of the, uh, continue with the, um, the, the rituals, the perpetuation of life. This is the mythology for all of them. Every single group of Native Americans practice human sacrifice. 
and in a belief that this was the only way to perpetuate the gods and life. Now, Spain, Europe in general. The belief in Europe was also that the earth was flat. And it ended on the oceans. There was actually the edge of the world. They believed that if they continued sailing, they would literally fall off the edge of the world. There's a uh, movie that came out, The uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. In one of the, one of the movies, you can actually see how the ship is on the edge of the world. That is exactly what it was believed by all the old world. That the, it was Finisterra, the end of the world, where ships were lost in areas close to land that they would see them. They would think that there were monsters devouring the ships. So they would write on the maps, there'd be dragons here. So they believed that they were the only inhabitants. When Christianity uh, was revealed, when Jesus was revealed as God, he died and resurrected and ascended into heaven in Jerusalem. So we know that we see God in Jerusalem. Now, in Genesis, we have that man is created in the image and likeness of God. He is placed on earth by God. So, if we're created in the image and likeness of God, then the world is created in the image and likeness of heaven. For God resides in the heavens. So, with Jerusalem as the center, we have Asia, Europe, and Africa. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's a Trinitarian world. It works perfectly, right? Then they discover America. That's sort of a little glitch in the, in the theological situation. There is no fourth person in the Trinity. So how do we deal with this? When they started communicating with the, with the natives, they would ask them, who created you? Who gave you life? Who's your God-giver of life? And they answered, the snake, Quetzalcoatl, the feather serpent. So we go back to Genesis. The snake is the devil that takes the shape of the snake in order to bring the downfall of mankind. However, these people were doing human sacrifices. They were doing ritual cannibalism. They were eating the flesh of those who were sacrificed. They would eat a small piece so that they, were communi they had communion with the gods. But they would give their own children for the sacrifices, men, women, children, elderly. The father of the child would not participate in the, in the, in the banquet, in the eating of the flesh, but everyone else did. So these people, must have been possessed. But then they, they thought, if the, if the devil created them, if they are the children of the serpent, then they have no soul. They're not human. Because the soul is a divine gift. So the devil cannot give a soul. So these are not human. And they're worse than animals, because if we look at Genesis in creation, God creates the, the animals on the earth, and he sees that they are good. So these people, or these beings, who are created by the devil, then they're worse than the animals. And they are evil. So they are to be destroyed. So they start conquering. Hernán Cortés leaves Cuba, arrives in the Yucatán Peninsula, meets with the Mayans, touches land in several places, and then makes his way all the way through the Gulf of Mexico into Veracruz. From Veracruz, he drives inland all the way up to Tenochtitlan, Mexico City, the, the seat of the Aztec Empire. There were a lot of things that happened just before the arrival of the Spanish. One of, there were several, but I'm going to touch only on one. The uh, sighting of Halley's Comet. 
for the natives, in this case, the Aztecs, a comet meant the end of an era. And then we begin a new one. But it's the end of the of an era. It would be the end of their life as they knew it. So this is one of those fatalistic times. There is something new but unknown. So they see Halley's Comet, the Aztec Emperor, who was himself once a priest, a high priest. He sees Halley's Comet, and then he gets word that there's white men coming inland on these animals that they had never seen, the horses. So this is all completely new to them. The, um, he sends some envoys to speak to this man. He thinks that it is the god Quetzalcoatl returning. I'll touch on that in a moment. They're from the Orient. So he sends gifts, different gifts. One of the things that he offers is gold and sends word to Hernán Cortés that he need not stay, that he thinks it's Quetzalcoatl. So everything is all right. The emperor is actually Take it using, keeping the throne that was originally belonging to Quetzalcoatl. So he was on a borrowed throne. So when Quetzalcoatl would arrive, then he was going to be dethroned. So he sends, he sends the gifts and tells him, everything is well, everything is good. We are keeping all of your teachings. We're doing all of the rituals. Go home. You come back some other time. Then... Um, which of course does not work. Quetzalcoatl was is part myth, part history. Quetzalcoatl was a white man. No one knows exactly where he came from. He was a white man that showed up around the um, 10th, 11th century, between the 10th and the 11th century. He met up with the Olmecs, the mother culture of America. They were nomads. He teaches them how to domesticate corn, how to, dom to the arts, he teaches them agriculture. He teaches them the arts, weaving, carving, painting, all of the different arts. Organizes their city as an estate. He lives separately in his own pyramid, in his own temple, his own house. He does not participate in the rituals, and he does not participate with the human flesh. And he actually introduces to them the knowledge that God is one who does not like human sacrifices. Obviously, that didn't take. So he would not participate in them. He abstained from any partner. He would not have a wife. So as things progressed, he established the city of Tula, the Toltecs. As, he, as uh, things progressed and everything was good and abundant, uh, Tolkien says that prosperity breeds envy. So he had enemies. They get him, they trick him, and get him drunk on pulque. Drunkenness was punishable by death. But they cannot kill him because they consider him to be a god. So they kick him out. They shunt him. So in shame, he leaves. And every time he meets up with another tribe of nomads, he establishes another city. Then his sin catches up with him, and he's kicked out. So he actually establishes a series of cities, a series of settlements. We can follow these, actually. We know the route that he took. He arrives at the Yucatan Peninsula, builds himself a ship, and then tells his followers that there will be a white god, where there will be white men with a white god coming from the Orient that will put all of the other gods in their place. And then leaves. Legend takes over and says that he is going to return. He promises to return. He jumps into a bonfire, purifies himself from his sin. We see here a volcano. And we have Quetzalcoatl emergent, purified from his sin. Then builds a canoe out of snakes and flies towards the east, the rising of the sun. 
where he will come back to take his place amongst the gods. So they were expecting this white man and this white god to come from the Orient. When Hernán Cortés arrives, they think that it is he. They take him to the main temple to show him how they're keeping everything that he had taught them in the, in, uh, with the rituals. They see a white man. Quetzalcoatl was a white man, bearded. The natives have very little facial hair. And then they offer him five human sacrifices in his honor. And they offer him the flesh to eat. Of course, he rejects it, disgusted, to say the least. The Aztec emperor is merely convinced that Quetzalcoatl, this must be Quetzalcoatl, because he did not partake in the eating of the human flesh. So, he does not, um, they kick him out, and he spends the next two years rallying all of the natives that were against the Aztec Empire, and then uh, comes back. One of the situations that happened is that they left disease. They left, when they left, they left the pox. That disease was not known in America. There were more natives killed by disease than by weapons. The, um, they started breaking out. They had never, they had never seen that. So they, um, they thought, obviously, that this was something with the gods. And that perpetuated even more the idea that the Spanish were the gods. We're going to take a break now. So, uh, 10 minutes? Is that okay? All right. <laughs>